Chris Bain with Rule Blimbo Radio, and this is RPPR episode 124, the Atomic Robo uh, Postmortem. And with me uh, are uh, Tom. Hi! <laughs> and Aaron. Hello. You. And of course, uh, Dan. Who... Uh, Ross, how can a robot have a postmortem? Uh, well, this is the. Topical! <laughs> uh, this is actually the. Um, <laughs> Campaign postmortem. So we're going to talk about. Oh, the, yeah. because oh yeah, you haven't ever been to one of these, have you? Well, in oh, terms, no. if you're talking about like a, a, a machine or a vehicle, we could say it's the black box. So black box. yeah, we're digging <laughs> up the black box uh, from, from the, the wreckage of what this thing is. So <laughs> all right. Uh, so uh, before we do that, we have some uh, news, of course. Uh, first off, the uh, let's see here, cosplay, uh, a base raiders supplement is out. Uh, cosplay were the team of NPC Raiders featured in, uh, let's see here, Cannon, uh, the one shot that was posted recently. <laughs> They're led by a form, form by uh, an elemental saber, a uh, Japanese schoolgirl who fought demons before uh, Ragnarok, and now she's back. And what? What? How is that even possible? Uh, also, uh, her allies, Pretty Soldier, a Russian uh, mech pilot, and uh, the Chosen One, a guy who thinks he's the Chosen One and believes <laughs> he is fulfilling Joseph Campbell's uh, hero of a thousand. Thousand faces, uh, kind of uh, thing going on with him. So, so is he going to explode in the end? Is that his ability? Maybe. Okay. Uh, it's a mystery. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, something to look forward to. Um, and let's see here. The Red Markets campaign uh, beta, or the Red Markets beta campaign, is uh, should be posted by the time you listen to this. Uh, or at least the first episode, The Brutalists. Uh, we played this uh, quite a while last year. Uh, Kale Brandon, excellent campaign. Uh, and Good, great characters all around. Great characters. Uh, now, I call this the Red Markets Beta because the rules are in beta format. So uh, don't pay attention too much to them because they pay, n- pay no attention to the rules. By the time the Kickstarter comes out, the rules will be very different. Uh, pay, well, atten- very di- pay attention to our antics. Yeah, to the story, the setting, uh, the excellent role playing. Uh, it was we had a lot of fun doing so it. So in this case, it's kind of like who's lined. It, uh, it's like the rules are made up and the points don't matter. <laughs> uh, something like that. That not that technically true for all RPGs? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, good point. Uh, excellent yeah. point there, Dan. That's oh, why we're uh, here. Oh, also, uh, latent P90X. Yes. Late, uh, uh, that was later on. Uh, so, uh, and then finally, another RPPR news. Uh, the uh, Raillery, I dug up some old videos uh, that were previously posted on blip.tv because I was trying to get some of that sweet ad revenue. But since that crashed and burned to the ground last year. And I year, never got any money. I think I only And they never found the black box to that. Uh, and I think I only got a few bucks worth of ad, ad revenue and they never paid me anyway. And then they crashed. The, the blip.tv is no longer around. So I just said, well, hey, I found the files and I'm going to upload them to YouTube. And they're gloriously low res because I didn't have uh, as good a recording capability for video games. They're vintage. Place. They're vintage, yes. Uh, so enjoy us playing the Warriors on the original Xbox. Warriors. And let's see here. What else? Oh, and I played some Killing Floor on a modded server that allowed uh, 30 people once. This is Killing Floor 1, by the way. Uh, so uh, And chicken that. outfits. And chicken outfits. And, and see, what uh, I remember about that Warriors game is that every time that we had our uh, game, which you should watch it, on the rooftop, it just became a mission of throwing every one of our gang members off of it. That's that's literally what the premise of that, that yeah, was <laughs> multiplayer mode is. Uh, the best part, though, was you could not only choose the various gangs in the Warriors, you could also choose the civilians and... Uh, for example, we did bum fights. Remember, we had the hobos oh, God, the uh, fight the vagrants. Uh, <laughs> it was yeah, horrible. It was horrible, and they played like vagrants, like they would stumble around. And they got the actual lady yeah. who did the uh, yeah, she originally did the, did the, yeah. the radio uh, DJ. The uh, and yeah. you can make your custom gangs. You could have mix and match characters, so mm-hmm. killer mimes with hobos allied for fighting baseball players. Can and baseball. you dig it? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no. So we have about an hour, fifty minutes of footage with of that. So yeah, uh, it was a long time mm-hmm. for that. Oh yeah, that was... I think that's when we also commented that yeah, the re-release of the Warriors sucked with those comic book. Uh, yeah, the director's cut. Yeah. The director's yeah. cut of the original movie. There is a remake in the works, supposedly. But that's in development hell. Yeah. So, and it won't be the same. Like every other remake, uh, probably uh, it will probably be terrible. But I don't. It, we don't know if it'll ever. Everything is yeah. terrible. Uh, we'll talk. We'll get to that. Yes, we will. Later. Uh, yes, we will. Uh, in the shout outs. So, uh, so that's it for news. Uh, why don't we get into the main topic, which of course the Atomic Robo campaign, uh, one of our shorter campaigns, uh, not the shortest. That would still be the final revelation uh, with Caleb, since that was only four sessions. This was seven. <laughs> uh, so beating it out just slightly. <laughs> almost twice as long um, 
So, Aaron, you ran this campaign. Uh, it's based, obviously, on the comic book, uh, yes. which we'll talk a little bit in the future. But why don't you talk about the origins of this campaign, both like why you decided to use this particular system, uh, what your ideas for running it were, uh, and that kind of thing. Okay. Um, well, the origins for this one particularly came up about, oh... I want to say uh, two years ago now <laughs> when we went to Gen Con and I ended up picking up the Atomic Robo camp, uh, campaign book. And I remember, who is it that you interviewed? Was it Mike Olson? Or? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Mike Olson was the uh, guy who wrote it. He was also the person uh, I feel indebted to because he's he came up with Strange Fate uh, in the Kerberos Club, uh, which is, of course, the basis of the rules for base raiders. So I was like, hey, what are you working on now? Oh, okay. I'll have to uh, uh, maybe look at that and possibly steal that. I mean, be inspired by it. <laughs> well, it's an open game license. I can't, I can't steal it. Well, so. remember how it – remember what Thad told us. Good artists borrow, great artists steal. Right. So, um, But I picked this up at Gen Con because I had read the Atomic Robo comic, which I believe you had led me to. Mm-hmm. Um, and the author who did this also did uh, 8-Bit Theater. If you, uh, It's like if you are familiar with that out in podcast land. Um a long time ago, and I immediately fell in love with it. To me, it kind of represents the science fiction, the pulp science fiction uh, version of Hellboy. <laughs> so instead of demons and monsters, it's the that's like perpetual robot versus all the weird science of the fifties. And it had the same kind of humor that you kind of saw in Eight Bit Theater as well, which I immediately fell in love with. Uh, particularly, I always bring up the one issue of. Uh, with Atomic Robo teaming up with Carl Sagan and they're sending this interdimensional monster back to its origin and of course they have a panel of Carl Sagan holding up a gun saying when you return to your indeterminate point of origin tell them Carl Sagan sent you. Uh, Yeah, what's Uh, wrong with that? Now There is absolutely nothing wrong with it which is why I was so ecstatic when I found out that they had a game for this. Um, So I read over it uh, and decided when we started to do the Patreon games um, I wanted to to definitely give this a try but having not run Face first, uh, Fate beforehand I wanted to do a uh, at least a test with the Patreon group. So, uh, since I guinea knew I pigs. could, they were my guinea pigs. Wonderful, wonderful guinea pigs who I'm very, oh, eternally appreciative of. Um, and so, the first game I did was uh, an homage to uh, all of the Tokus, uh, the uh, Super Sentai and uh, Power Ranger stuff, since they do have a team in the canon uh, called the uh, Science Team Super Five. Uh, that will, and I called it Big Trouble in Akihabara. So I had the players uh, take the role of uh, Tesla Dine agents who were going over there to help Big Science Inc. And eventually they decided, got a chance to fight a giant monster in their own mech suit, which I had developed for this. Uh, which, if you listen to the campaign, you then that's called the Large Hadron Defender. Right. So, uh, and we'll put a link to that uh, Patreon game because yeah. uh, I think that was put on the podcast insert quest here. That- yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, our friends over at Insert Quest here, which uh, Ray was part of that uh, initial that, that initial Patreon game, put it on there. Okay. Uh, so once I did that, I hopefully I remember to do that. <laughs> hopefully. hopefully. Um, so we'll see about that. Maybe Let me circle that. But once I did that game, I really got the idea to expand it into a whole campaign because that was kind of the seed that germinated from there. And I initially talked to everybody, and they showed an interest with that. Uh, Ross specifically, since he never gets the chance to run, play in any games. I, I, yeah, it's weird. I, I, I jump at the chance. Which we him. did that, especially not like Caleb's a great GM and everything, but his games, they're not. Cheerful, let's say he tends to run games that are like a little grimdark. Uh, yeah, and not. I mean, not like stereotypical grimdark, but like you know, nihilist grimdark. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, but it's, it's, you're it's, always it's screwed special. no matter what. So, uh, so and you are not um, a beautiful and unique snow. And I'll fully admit that I uh, I love playing in those games, but I am not cut from the same cloth. So I I kind of have to go with the goofier route. Well, I mean that's a, that, or the Fraggle Rock route, if you will. Right. So. Well, I mean that's the thing is like getting a chance to play a game that's not as super dark was like oh. Oh my god, that's awesome. It's, it's a change of pace. Um, so that's when I started developing it and thinking about what villains I could bring out because uh, thankfully Atomic Robo has been going on for a while since the mid 2000s. Right. So it has a pretty wealth, uh, a large wealth <laughs> of good villains. Uh, but I kind of knew after 
I think the first the, after the first day of really thinking about this, who the villain was going to be. Right. Um, now, if you haven't read the comics, these will be spoilers for it. Um, it's all available on the website. So uh, spoiler I, alert! Yeah. Trigger warning. Yeah. Oh. Dan, please. No. (laughs) No, we do not need that coming back on us. Okay. Uh, Anyway, um, and I know this is spoiler alert for almost a decade-year-old comic. No. Decade-old comic. but I still haven't read it, so. Okay, well, you played it, so you kind of (laughs) know about it. you played the campaign. Do you remember the bad guy in the campaign? Yes. Yeah, there you go. So. Vader is Luke's um, yeah. But here is it. Uh, this, I actually pulled the primary villain from the uh, series, uh, the Ghost of Station X, uh, known as Alan. This is an artificial intelligence that was created by Alan Turing back in the right. 50s. And when he was summarily dismissed from British intelligence, um, he... The program was left running on its own. They never knew he never knew what happened to him until later. Uh, so it just kept on its process right. of becoming a intelligence until it decided that humanity its projection so that humanity wouldn't survive past the twenty fifties. So he thought, I'll build an Orion ship that's nuclear powered, get the hell out of here, and screw the rest of humanity. Not maliciously. It's just logic. So um, Robo ended up stopping him, but at the very end of the series, there is a little Hint, uh, spo- uh, a little hint to see that he survived. They showed a leaf that had kind of blue right. bioorganic circuitry on it. So that was kind of my uh, beginning from there to think, okay, that's how I can bring him in. So, okay. uh, and yeah, and that's where it started. Yeah. And uh, you did the whole point of that, the Orion ship, uh, the reason why it was bad is because it would have destroyed all life on the Earth. Yeah, it was nuclear it launched, pa- yeah, it was, nu- it was nuclear power. The fallout yeah. would have scattered through the atmosphere yeah. and it would have killed um, everybody except Robo. And um, in the story, the only reason he didn't kill Robo outright, he said, oh, you're going to survive and follow me in about 500 years, so why didn't you come with me? Right. Which was declined. Uh, so that was the setup for the campaign. And uh, and so we kind of, after your Patreon game, we kind of just jumped in. And so um, talking to, let's talk to the players uh, a little bit. Uh, uh, Tom and Dan here. Uh, David could not make it today. Uh, but... Tom, why don't you talk about some of your impressions that came in, like going in, uh, first, like going in, making your character, like what were you thinking? Because your character, uh, you were like... Jürgen von Hauptmann, the, the ex-Nazi dinosaur, the ex-Nazi dinosaur that clearly had to rein in his animalistic rage. Uh, yeah, that became the running gag between yeah. our characters. I'll talk about my character after you guys. Yeah. Um, so talk about like why you, what led to your character's creation and... Okay, to be honest... Dr. Dinosaur really is what made me any interested in Atomic <laughs> Robo. Such a great character, but at the same time, not playable as a player. No, he's no, an antagonist, no. and, and he's delusional. Uh, yeah, and crystals. Yeah. And we're not even sure what his power comes from, or if he has any. Right. But so, yeah, that was... So you wanted a Dr. Dinosaur-type character. I did, but, you know, who was sane. Yeah. And, uh, had, a lot of hi- and had a lot of history. And that's and I kind of like and I you know me the monstrous hero is my absolute favorite archetype always has always no <laughs> really I'm glad Tom's <laughs> self aware of this I am it made me it yeah it it helps me keep track of things in my life yeah but I knew it was going to be something like that mm-hmm. and so I thought okay well I can't be Doctor Dinosaur because that would just that would be a disaster right so I kind of thought on my own and. Uh, this is okay. It's silly. I should go for an accent in this one. <laughs> so, like, you know, the German accent, like, okay, what the hell? He was an ex Nazi scientist way back in the day. But that was, you know, dude, it, that, yeah, he, they, that way, he found out the Nazi party really wasn't much of a party. Uh, yeah. It, did you work with Aaron to come up with your character? Or did you just like, Aaron, here's the idea? No, I, I, yeah. I mentioned it to him before to make sure it would work. Okay. Yeah, and then we uh, actually <laughs> collaborated a little bit to say, okay, what was going forward? Because um, in terms of David's character, um, Dr. Malavolent, who right. um, he – uh, I had asked him if Tom, if he wanted to be an actual Nazi or if he wanted to be part of Helsingard, which was their Nazi esque stand in. So right. for that, uh, they're mad scientists. Yeah, they're they're mad scientists. So basically, the Atomic Robo's Hydra, right. um, and he and David decided to go with Helsingard for his character, but Tom just didn't. Yeah, I kind of said like, see. no, I was actually with them back when I had to join this party to get any kind of government science job back in the thirties. Right. And then realized, oh, shit, they're kind of assholes. Yeah. Oh, what do I do now? Yeah. 
And Where then you just go with paper Operation Paperclip. And I'll turn myself right into an immortal dinosaur. Well, that it, that wasn't on purpose. Okay. All right. Yeah, I was expecting. Yeah, I thought it would. It would. Be, I was. My project. I had my project was. I was searching for immortality because. Yeah, I mean Hitler wouldn't be interested in that. Uh, so. But then I decided. In did, terms of making your character, though, you you just basically like here's the things I like having fun the most. This is pretty the, much. And also, yeah. I thought of the science the sciences that most people wouldn't be going for in the group. Okay. And you know, David already said what he was going for. You kind of mentioned what sciences you were going for. So, like, okay, I'll be the biologist geneticist of the group. Okay. Because I was also there to make sure my skills could, you know, complement. Right. And not be redundant. I mean, yeah, and Tom and Grobo, mm-hmm. like, everyone's supposed to be a scientist type. So you want to, instead of, like, the, the, the D&D thing of everybody being, you know, fighter, <coughs> you know, tank, DPS, healing, you want mm-hmm. heart, physical sciences, life sciences, you know, engineering, yeah. et, cetera, et cetera. And it was actually Aaron's um, idea that I want to say, like, you know, I actually had a cooking show that was okay. done that was done via a robotic pro- human robotic proxy yeah that was the idea that you could uh, to kind of uh, help with your own funding and legitimate, because legitimize your that kind of got Tesla thrown dying. by the wayside it did but we, yeah. we had determined that yeah unfortunately that, and that's I'll talk about that after yeah, yeah. the training day uh, but. For, Dan you joined in the campaign in our third session I believe uh, second, uh, second, it was, second cause it was he, after the giant robot yes no no it was during giant robot oh because that was second yeah, session it was in the middle of your guys's uh Adventures in Japan is one. Yeah, actually, it would have been the third because uh, he came in on the second part of uh, Big Trouble. So, okay. Uh, so Dan, talk about your character concept. Um, I I played Project Fluffy. Um, I yeah. played Project Fluffy. I couldn't tell you right now what the acronym stood for, but that was. <laughs> it doesn't have to stand for anything. You it, know? it did at the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the ferociously large fighting feline. Mark Y. That's what it was. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> wow. Nice. So, I don't think I ever... Yeah. Uh, and you were, you were created by one of the villains. Uh, yes. When I, was, uh, I was a Shinka. Yeah, you were uh, a bi- uh, basically a Biomega created by Dr. Shinka. Yeah, right. I, but in effect, I was an uplifted white tiger. Right. Um, that had decided that, you know what, Shinka's really not where it's cracked up to be defected and joined up with uh, Big Science, Inc. So... Since they at least give you a pension. Well, like, how did you come to that idea, like, as a character? Did you talk to Aaron? He's like, what would work? Well, talking to Aaron and talking to what the other... To what the people had, I realized, like, you know, if you're doing... From what you guys were experiencing in the campaign up until that point, it seemed like you needed some kind of physical character muscle some kind of muscle yeah. like yes tom was really good at being a giant dinosaur but he, you know he was sunk into doing that yeah mm-hmm. and so that's kind of where i was going for and it's like well if it's mad science and i, I didn't get to play an eclipse phase I, I, I wanted to play an uplift so <laughs> okay i'm gonna be the mad science version of an uplift and okay. do all sorts of shenanigans well okay. and, and w- can you regale for us what your primary scientific discipline was um, I had to pick one because Aaron insisted that I had to <laughs> have some kind of science background to justify my presence in the campaign setting. Not everybody can be Jenkins. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so it's like, well, since I'm such a physical character, I'm going to take, I'm going to be more of a doctorate in philosophy and metaphysics. <laughs> uh, which actually turned out very well because a lot of this campaign involved. Uh, teleportation, alternate realities, and time travel later yep. on. Yeah. So that actually became very useful. It's kind of yes. a uh, fill in the blank. Oh, this is weird. Well, I'll have the tiger figure it out. Uh, <laughs> have the tiger stare at it for a while. The tiger! And eventually come up with something. Yeah. Uh, so tiger philosophy! That kind of worked. Um, and so I think, yeah, in terms of overall, some of the, our greatest strengths in the campaign were like uh, the the characters and our like our bits are role playing and how we reacted to the very improbable kind Wait, of Ross. problems and, that we yeah. have and we have forgotten about your your, your contribution oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, to the campaign I should, yeah well, yeah uh, so my character uh, again in terms of discipline uh, was an engineer but the concept actually was not my own I actually went on the RPPR Facebook group and asked what Aaron's going to run Atomic Robot what should my character concept be. And there were many people, uh, there were several ideas, uh, but someone had a great idea that I had to run with, uh, and that was a human who thinks he's an android. Yeah, you're Fry from yeah. Insane in the Main Brain. Uh, so I think I'm a robot, but I'm really not. Uh, and they but we just, have no reason to doubt you. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm more advanced than Robo himself because uh, I look and act and bleed exactly like a human. And feel pain. And feel pain. Uh, why were you programmed to feel why pain? Was I, why can't I shut off my pain uh, circuits? Uh, so <laughs> And Robo just hasn't doesn't have the heart to tell you. Apparently no one does. They have a really poor mental health uh, uh, HR Or we're policy. saying, like, dude, if we, if, we tried, if we told you this, you wouldn't be able to handle it. Uh, yeah. So they just kept me on working, and I was like, I made my character more of a social uh, character since I'm an infiltration robot. Uh, <laughs> so someone had to be the social character. So that was my primary thing. And my secondary thing was engineering. Uh, so I could just be the practical <laughs> guy. Uh, so yeah, that was my concept. And, and I think I it, do think that's to me was the best part of the game was our interaction between the characters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just I mean, well, we, Aaron did a great job of setting up circumstances for us to be really to to bicker in, you know, <laughs> uh, especially. I think that, but yeah, we, yeah, but yeah, yeah. We never bickered in a malicious way. It was, well, yeah, it was, uh, it was. It was actually it was banter, and it, it, it seemed it seemed perfect for people that have been working together for years. And that to me, that's why I was so grateful about having you all here for it because the heart of this game is very much um, not only the science the scientific adventure, but the comedic edge behind it. Yeah, that it was definitely a comedic game. It, it's supposed to be you're looking at a fifty foot tall giant slobbering monster going. The spice flows. The <laughs> hell. So, uh, well, I think yeah, a lot of it was like we were a trying to fit our square uh, peg into the round hole that was the campaign. Absolutely. And I think the best part was the, for example, the nightclub trying to get into the nightclub. <laughs> oh you know, my god. <laughs> I'm austerity. <laughs> austerity. Yeah, I, this, yeah, the dinosaur <laughs> represents austerity. Uh, oh let us god. in. Uh, so. I, feel, oh, I like God. that I kind of uh, like we will and that that's kind of the the also the or the also I think my like okay like dude like you need to control that animalistic rage yeah. uh, <laughs> and me just it was there's a lot of good improv in terms of like uh, figuring out um, between yeah that and then of course uh, David uh, chewing as much scenery as he could dude he was a, dude he was like a scenery buffet and he uh, just piled his and Dan being high. the actually most stable and well adjusted yeah. person I think with I think. you we had stuff like, like do you like it when people scratch behind your ears yeah Meh. yeah <laughs> no and 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 as the benefit it was one it was wonderful to do but it was a hard challenge to keep up um with. yeah i think i think that was uh it so um because i think that part of the problem obviously uh in the campaign uh is the the rules of the mechanics because fate gaming running yeah. a fate game i think is more challenging than running say a D or call of cthulhu type game because players have s- a more agency in fact, they're supposed to. They're supposed to have yeah. more agency than you're used to as a GM. And that's good. I really love running with that because I. it's one of the reasons why I'm not that fond of D&D or a lot of the D20 systems that came well, after even that. Cthulhu, like. Or even Cthulhu because it restricts you to a very uh, a very specific set, play, set of plays. <laughs> Um, and the fate ultimately is more about it is very storytelling. It's more about that f- free imagination, which I think fits well with Atomic Robo because you're just cooking up mad science all the time. Right. Um, but again, some of the rules we did not get into um, because I didn't fully understand well, yeah, it. Yeah, I think that was the problem. Is uh, we repeated the mistake of Tribes of Tokyo in that we did <laughs> not run a one shot before we got into the campaign, like you did with the Patreon people, but you didn't do it with like. The- us and like. and that's also my fault because I thought ultimately the first session, um, which I labeled training day, which yeah. you kind of get most of the background. Um, I had meant that to be more of more informative of what you should do, and specifically yeah. like with the brainstorming, which I meant to really get that into. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately- that was that was something that was commented on, and like there's a whole. Have you looked at it now, like the brainstorming mechanics? Yeah, I have looked a little bit more now. What are the brainstorming mechanics uh, specifically that you can stop and then make roles to collaboratively work? Towards Towards it, so basically all towards your, a solution. Yeah, so something. that's what you do, or toward or towards a an invention which will be in the form of like a stunt, a mega stunt, okay, uh, that will fix the problem. For so the everyone stunt. works together to make something, a MacGuffin to de- defeat. <coughs> yeah, pretty much plot so. MacGuffin, and that's something that I, if I, when I do all run this again, um, I would love to be able to actually stop and have them do that as well. Um, so Dan, you, one of the reasons why you wanted to play this game, you mentioned in our preparation, was because you wanted some experience with fate before you ran. Or uh, to compliment you because you're running Dresden Files, which is obviously Fate as well. Right. Um, so, in terms of playing in Fate, uh, what did you learn? I mean, what were your experience? What are your thoughts on? Uh, uh, I had never really like I'd done some base raiders one shots, and I've done, and that was pretty much the extent of Fate that I've yeah. done. 
but I never really got a feel for uh, because my idea, my preconceptions with Fate was that it's very much like we were talking about where the players get agency and the GM just has to respond to the level yeah. of agency that players get. And that's what I was planning to do with Dresden Files. And so that's what I was expecting. And I just, I, I guess I was still way too new because I didn't understand how the mechanics work. I didn't yeah. really understand how. Things. It didn't help that you were dropped in in the middle of the second session. Right. Too. Yeah. But I figured that I could just follow everyone's lead. But I just kind of got to a point where I felt like that I didn't have as much agency as I thought I would as a player. Yeah. And so that just. that Were there help. specific circumstances that that happened? Uh, it, I felt that there was, I felt that there was a little bit of a narrative disconnect for the campaign in the sense that we were having to deal with that ultimately we were dealing with a threat that Robo struggles with, but at the same time that we couldn't quite reach a point where we could ever be as cool as Robo to deal with that threat. Okay. Okay. And so, whether it was yeah. just that our attempts would fall flat or. Anything that, and part of that is that, that this is a licensed setting, which is a whole right. separate thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so and, yeah, I mean, and sometimes I also admit, yeah, I, I think it was like the big. Pro- I think another problem was it was each of the sessions were kind of run more like a one shot. Okay, because it was because uh, it, it had a, not enough continuity. Yeah, it had, okay. you know, and it had a little bit a little bit of the railroadiness that you have to have in a one shot. Yeah, and I admit that's something of a failing on my end that I was not used since this is really the first full campaign setting that yeah. I've run for a, a full group. I've done things with Tom and David before, <coughs> but that's years ago and obviously not recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's yeah that that is something that I feel that was a little bit not needed to work on, and also. Um, Something that I wanted to work for possibly a future version of this, if anybody wanted to run, is that part of the middle part of this was always supposed to be about the chase. That yeah. you're trying that you're trying to figure out where Alan is or what who's the puppeteer, which ultimately is Alan, right. and that there are different branches that they went to go to. So I had initially had planned out for you to get have choices of where you need to go as well, but just because of circumstances of how I was working at the time and what I was trying to do, it didn't function like that unfortunately and i think that might have been that might have been what the problem was and you trying to run it because the more i have been running fate in the sense of a long-term campaign the more i realize that you know my best laid plans as to what i want to do is not going to matter once I allow the players to exercise their ability to control. Yes, uh, your fragile, delicate plan yeah. when released into the uh, wild is trampled to death immediately. Well, no, it's like you know, even before running, like, <coughs> well, we can talk about Dresden on other times, but even throughout that campaign, like there were some plot points that I knew that for the story that I wanted to tell had to happen. And as a failing as a GM on my part, I wasn't giving the right motivation for PCs to pick up on those hooks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why the last session of the season ended up feeling really railroady. And because it was just like, I need this event in the story to happen for other things in later seasons to make right. sense. And that's and, very that's very tricky because, I yeah. mean, it's... Yeah. Tricky. People. How do you tell a story that you have in mind when half of the, the, the story happens during the game you know you right. can't you can't you have to make certain assumptions that and players don't necessarily want to do and know? so i think in designing a fake campaign it's very important for you to understand that it's not really a plan that it's more of a framework yeah that, that it has to that you that the pcs yeah. fill in yeah. and and that's kind of yeah you're right that's the lesson that i've learned from this is that i need to just basic if i'm doing a camp frame, campaign setup Go ahead and have my write up as necessary, but set up <coughs> bullet points more off that this is what we need to hit, and just create a playground that they yeah. can. I think find that, was, it that in. seemed like that seemed like more the problem is yeah, it's, you think you over prepared, uh, yeah, like you like you planned so far ahead, but but and you realize, but it, yeah, then you, it's kind of got like we didn't need to go to some of those places, but like you had planned it, and you was kind of like well, I think don't I think I don't we have to go here. I think some of it, it actually reminds me, you know, talking about the continuity thing, mm-hmm. that's actually a critique uh, several people gave me with the sense of the slide of hand man, mm-hmm. uh, which is also a seven session campaign. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was one of the shorter ones. And uh, because it was the dreamlands, like every episode felt to some people like a one shot. Like when you wake up here, you have to go from point <laughs> A to point B. But in the second session, okay, so in the first session, we're on land. Then, uh, then we're in the sea. Then we're in a port city. And then we're here. And then, oh, this happens. And... 
so people felt that they weren't as tied into the campaign because like these it was a traveling campaign so I guess that's part of a challenge of doing a campaign where it's also about a, about a journey going from one long place to another yeah so like that actually is probably a challenge in the future um, like we also did that with Fortunes of War a long journey yeah but there was a lot of continuity in that the people we traveled with were consistent you know like we were traveling with the, the, all these NPCs <laughs> and there was an ongoing problem like we had to get funding we had to make money or your characters did in order to survive, and so there wasn't any of those the, those anchors, those that those constants. So, so and that's yeah. and I was I think I tried to do that a little bit basically with the uh, with the uh, Tesla Dyne. Uh, yeah, we had the off, uh, it's like, oh offices yeah. or, uh, around when you couldn't go back to the main one as well. Right, uh, but that kind of brings up I guess one of the other difficulties is that it was a license setting. And there are certain rules there that are established, and especially because we were dealing with the movers and shakers uh, of that um, setting. Unlike Dresden Files, where we're in a way different city, and we haven't met anyone from any of the big name characters. I yeah, think. Yeah, you, you guys. You've um, made up everything. I yeah, like by and large in the Dresden Files campaign, like the PCs. All of the major PCs that I've introduced into the campaign have a tie to a main character, but yeah. the in, that's the intention is that their ties help establish you guys in the setting without immersing you in the sense that Harry Dresden can show up and fix your problems for you. And ultimately, what I thought my solution to this would have been um, is introduce using Robo and Tesla Dine to introduce you to the world, yeah. and then taking him out of the picture, or just setting him as a background voice. Right. But the problem with that was um, you did it, and this is obviously again, campaign problems, um, you did it in a way that we kind of saw you foreshadowed it but you foreshadowed the blue leaf in the first session so or the blue plant the blue plant which I I immediately regret because I'm just kind of showing my hand you noticed it and like hey what's with that yeah and I've thought about other ways that would have been interesting that I would have said uh, had you uh, possibly when you were doing just day to day activities on that first game uh, roll and say oh that's interesting what should that be and somebody coming up to you oh that's just a, a new strain that we're working on and then make another old to see if these lied. If it fails, nothing. If you do, uh, well, that well, that then that, there you go. Know. Like you can't like it, it's it shows one of the ways in which running a game is actually more difficult than writing fiction because <laughs> in fiction you your characters can all obey. Yeah, so if everyone's like, try, but <laughs> well, it's like everyone was an idiot and didn't notice the danger <laughs> in the office because uh, that's they were all because they're all crazy because we have a Nazi dinosaur who can't control himself and bloodlust a crazy yeah. person and uh, four minutes of- but you do have the problem that you yeah you saw immediately ooh ooh what's that what's that yeah. and unfortunately I'll admit I was not good enough to just slap my hand into like I'm not telling you yeah no we were like we immediately <laughs> want to get that thing uh, and we and it kind of so my what I would do as a game master, you could do the exact same thing, but you have to remove all possibility of the PCs having any effect on each other. So like, have the blue have them watch a video of uh, Atomic Robo get the plant after they've already left the island and be like, oh god, oh this is this is this was shot thirty minutes ago, ah! and then it's like they're helpless, they can't kill it with fire. Yeah, they can't do anything. Yeah, my, it's too late. Yeah, know? my my plan if I ever you run, you can't give them any chance of interacting with it whatsoever if it's important. I mean, Dan, was that kind of the same thing in uh, Dresden? For that season finale, you're talking about, oh, this certain thing has to happen. Well, no, like, I needed that whole session to happen. But there wasn't, because that session was, that session was a plot thread that had been building through the entire time. Because I needed to set up, I knew that the primary conflict for the campaign as a whole is going to be the conflict with the FOMOR. Yeah. And so I needed to help establish the rules of war with the FOMOR. And I needed the players to get an understanding that these guys will play dirty these guys won't these guys will take cheap shots and they will hit you where it hurts the most if they can and it seemed like you guys <coughs> recognized them as a threat but you weren't understanding the lengths that they were willing to go to yet so for the season finale I just kind of pumped the brakes and did and handled it as I did and left it as kind of a cliffhanger of you get so the the PCs of both groups would just go well hell Okay. So, <laughs> oh, great. Now we have to kill them all. So, it wasn't the same circumstance where, like, you needed a thing to happen, but you wanted to show it to the players and yet not them do give them the possibility of them doing anything, but then hoping they don't do the thing. Like, yeah. Well, the thing is, is like one of the NPCs was doing this and it was Mira running this 
particular gambit and I wanted the because everybody seemed to have a mistrust for the NPC that I put there to be your organizational tie in. Right. And so I was hoping that people would buy into her machinations and looking into what she's doing and what's going on with her and realize what she was doing and set up for this conflict with the foam war and create some kind of tension between that because I was wondering if the part if the PCs of both groups were going to try to split and do their own okay. thing or what <laughs> but that's getting into a yeah, different yeah, campaign yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I was just saying like the difficulty of doing like you because you have to foreshadow these things right yeah. and you can't uh, but you can't make it to where it's ruined. too blunt or well, yeah, you can't ruin the thing that it's foreshadowing right so. <laughs> that was the, and I think I was too much the yeah. other way I didn't foreshadow enough to engage okay the so there, there's the other yeah. difficulty you can't, you're a, bit, a little too you're cautious. looking for the sweet spot yeah you're looking yeah, for just the sweet spot. that in between where it's something interesting to catch their eye but it doesn't immediately look out going it doesn't have the villain halo over it saying or it's something that they can't interact with which yeah. is another or, or it's, just, it's a report we read among many other reports right. yeah which by the way that I think I would do it next time mm-hmm. um, is that I would have them just do training day to get it over with and to introduce them to the world send them over to Big Science Island and then when they're reporting back have Robo answer, but he's acting weird, and then see the blue plant in the background. I'm like, okay. what's going on? And then when they you try know, to get back to the could, island, I mean, there, and there are other ways to do. It. Uh, for example, well, what, we could all go around and how would we foreshadow? So Dan, just so you know, yeah, the blue plant was how Alan took right. over. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, so it was important for the villain's plot. If that plant wasn't there, the plot wouldn't have happened the way it happened. Mm-hmm. So it has to be there. So for example, one other way you could do it is say. Not even the players don't even see the lab, uh, see the plan itself. So what they do is, oh, the botany lab opened up next door to Atomic Robo's office. It's the new wing, but it's buggy. And oh, they look at the oh, look at those workmen. They're being kind of <laughs> shitty, and be like, oh, pff, we're not going to waste our time helping like, workmen do their Frank, job. Frank, that's not how we move equipment in and out. Yeah. <laughs> and so during and then during the adventure, say, oh, we, yeah, oh, they hear an explosion back. Oh, that's the botany lab. Something blew up. What, what, how is the botany lab blowing up? I don't know. It's Tesla dying. It's Tesla dying. It's yeah. fine. And then when they get back, oh, God, there's a blue leaf on your head, bro. But what's going on? So, like, they could have done something about it had they done boring maintenance work. But no player in their right mind would do that. So they feel dumber for doing that. They're like, oh, God. We're the so we're going under the, the, the player punishment option. No, it's just no, like, it's oh, player punishment. it's player investment. Like, yeah. they have to fix their mistake. They have to, like, they have to redeem themselves because we could have prevented this. So that's one way of doing it. Okay. Tom, how would you? I, I, as, as I said, I would do like, you know, because we get probably get reports on all kinds of different science sure. th- uh, events throughout the world. Like, as I as we just like mixed in with uh, one of many like mm. kind of reports we're getting of uh, like yeah there's some kind of weird blue plant that was found right outside like you know either uh, Tesla like, Dine, yeah. Tesla Dine or Livermore Labs or like, some, okay or like Sac Norad some place yeah you know, like there's like some weird we're, blue plants were found around some kind of scientifically significant area. So you surround it with a bunch of red herrings, like, oh, we found another Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a, it's, it's definitely not a guy in a suit this time. We think maybe they just surgically implanted hair on a guy and gave him a lot of drugs. We don't know why. <coughs> yeah. But yeah, it, 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 like, I, I just a number of reports, and then that's thrown in there. Yeah. It's like, and, uh, so there's some weird blue plants found, and then move right along. Right. Yeah. Cause, All right, Dan. <laughs> um I would probably handle it in a way that would just make it so that it would be annoying but interesting and kind of like on what you were doing, Ross, but instead of it being the botany lab and yeah. instead of having the – in meeting Robo in his office, it's Robo kind of like giving a tour or walking with them around the facility. He's like, I've got stuff to do. You guys need to walk with me and get this Oh, yeah, back. West Wing kind of thing. And that's yeah. what I kind of did initially. Yeah. So. And then yeah. just have like the blue plant keep showing up. <laughs> Okay. In different ways. And it's just like, and Robo finally is like, why the hell is this plant following us around? Yeah. I'm going to take it to the botany lab and I'm going to make sure it stays there. So, oh, oh, yeah, so okay. the NPC <laughs> solves the problem. So the player's like, oh, good. Atomic Robo's got this. We don't have to b- worry about it. And then when they're back, oh, God, why did we not? Why didn't we do this ourselves? No. Let's so, see, okay. So, yeah, when be our good boss one. says, I've got this. Yeah. yeah right. um, like, so, yeah. So, Aaron, how would have you, uh, in, in the uh, alternate timeline, and the alter, yeah, the, the alternate timeline for this. Uh, probably the way I would have done this uh, is that the uh, players would one of the, one of the things <laughs> they were being forced to do for monotonous is that uh, they would have to go th- cataloging things through, and one of the things they do find since 
this would be a sample taken off of Hiroshima Island, I think. It mm. was in Ghost of Station X, which is where the lab was. Yeah. Um, and that's where the blue plant found. It's something that was just filed away because they were taking samples of everything. And then either they can screw up, break something, or if somebody startles them and they see if they drop it. It's like, oh, we got to take this. Out. So you would have extended out into more of a full encounter. A full a encounter. Session. Yeah, encounter. And then that's when things start going wrong. Okay. And then uh, once Ro- Robo comes in and saves the day, then okay. he's uh, it's like, this gives them the chance to go ahead and test out themselves, their own abilities and the and the game rules. So basically just changing the scenario so it's more tightly integrated. Yeah, so okay. to make sure that it, it's, it's, it can still be in there and, and coherent to the story. But ultimately when Robo comes and he takes care of it, oh, the great hero took care of this. We don't have to worry about it. Two sessions later, holy shit, he's covered in it. <laughs> so, <laughs> oops, uh, why did we do that? Um, so, yeah, and and this is the kind of thing you have to learn. Running the campaign is definitely running uh, different from running one shots. Or yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and a couple other things that were at least bigger. Um, the one thing that it was a little bit harder to integrate to because uh, obviously Alan was the whole mastermind behind yeah. everything, and there are stats in there to actually give him fate points to be able to. Uh, throw different things at you so that's why sometimes I would end up making spends on mine for my secret pool uh, to be able to take care of that that was outside of the normal ones Um, which was also answering a question that uh, came up on the uh, the comments on here I think it was Adam asked this Mm. Uh, if that I I had a plan to deal with uh, escalation when the players kind of went outside the frame or if I just did it on the fly um kind of both now because we had that point that point pool available so like when you were dealing with um the oh I'm trying to think of the name of the uh, which session was it submarine uh, no not submarine it was the nightclub so oh, nightclub. uh that was the, with, the robot dudes that came down yeah which is the um okay i can't remember the name of the, the group the, 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 the cyborgs yeah, so yeah the mooks so that's why they got upgraded immediately too it's like oh hey you yep. can work it's like Alan just gave you a boost in your programming. Go. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean you have to do that as a GM too, um, in order to come up with new threats. Uh, and also in terms of mechanics, I think um, one of the mechanical problems I think I saw was that a lot of the skill rolls uh, were made with that we were always using our primary thing to roll. So I feel that there was a little bit of roll inflation in terms of hitting target numbers that we had to. And I feel that's kind of a, also a problem in base raiders too because oft, I noticed a lot of players in base raiders, especially if they're new, they make a character that's really good at one thing and then they try to use make everything solvable by that one problem. And that makes them very fragile in other ways and that's kind of more annoying to me as a GM instead of having a general purpose jack of all trades. And I was going to ask you about that too because uh, I know I think the way that Atomic Robo tried to mitigate this Mm -hmm. was uh, the setup of the modes this time around where instead of just having those skill sets um, which Base Raider does kind of have where you right. can set up everything, the powers, but they had specific modes to label underneath everything as well and right, hopefully but, make it even. Right. I mean, and that's true, but we a lot of times it felt like we were rolling for our primary, our best sign skill a All lot the of time. the times. Or for the, like, anytime there's a physical challenge, throw the dinosaur and tiger at it. Uh, <laughs> well, that's what, we're, that's what t- we're there for. Dinosaur and tiger, uh, my new ska band. Uh, <laughs> that, you know. Prime my screamo band, sorry. Um, the so I feel part of it, and also in running a campaign, is you have to figure out ways to challenge the characters in their weak spots. So like, come up with scenarios where the non-social character has to be social, and not make it just a rolling skill chest, but like be more creative about it. So it's it, it's you know in superhero games. Uh, you have to come up with like scenarios in which Superman has to deal with fucking kryptonite, uh, and. That I mean, again, that that's sort of tailoring scenarios for individual characters, and this is close to a superhero game in terms of like character customization. Yes, uh, especially so. also with stunts and mega stunts, where we could come up with new abilities on the fly. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. and I feel that you're like you're saying that there was a role inflation situation going on where it felt like that, you know, yes, I'm really good at using my claws, but I still had to roll like three or four pluses, yeah, on the dice in order to feel effective, yeah, and that was. And I feel that, and I, and occasionally that's fine because like you come yeah. up against like giant enemy crab, uh, <laughs> right. who's super armored. But then you have to f- come up with do like I know in base raiders, uh, we had that happen the boiling point uh, boiling point playtest where the last shark 
uh, leader with super heavy armor and none of your single attacks could get through. But that's when you guys tag team them by uh, doing a bunch of aspect maneuvers to give you guys one person a bunch of bonuses. So he got like a ridiculous, like a plus 12 roll to splatter the guy uh, yeah. at the end. Um, and that's kind of, but you can't do that all the time. So yeah. Right. And I think that the way that character creation is different in Ro- in Robo as it is in other types of fate that I have seen. Um, and so I'm sure it's used other places, especially yeah. if it's because it works. Um, just that the different modes that you just get a set of skill sets and the overlaps give you inherent bonuses yeah. up the ladder. It's just it's really easy to get really good at one thing. Yeah. And so then it's just like, well, if I'm really good at this one thing and now I'm and I'm put in situations where this is the thing that I'm good at and now I'm not good at it because I can't mm-hmm. because my attempts are failing constantly then what is my character doing? Like right. it's not even a way of challenging the challenge their weak spots. Mm-hmm. It's you have to give their strengths a time to shine. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. why do you invest in this? Yeah. And um it's like sinking almost <coughs> all of your skill points into operate heavy machinery in Call of Cthulhu <laughs> and then never having it be relevant. Uh speaking of trigger warnings. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. did, did that did that bring back flashbacks? God, it was fucking filled with heavy machinery. You could have operated <laughs> and, one time. I asked, and I but also no. I also think, and this game is a good example. Like the pit, one of the pitfalls you can fall into in an established setting is letting the well-known NPCs of the sto- of the storyline overshadow the players, which yeah. I actually think did not happen. No, no I, it did I, not happen to. Uh, I I made that a point. I mean, not I, mean, to there, do I think that. Jenkins came close one time. And uh, he, which session was that? Was that the <clears throat> nightclub when or, the or tiger Kirby? wearing a cloaking device could not sneak up on him at all? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, uh, and that one, uh, yeah, I meant that to be more of a joke. The joke, since you guys had kind of taken care of most everything else, so I, I wanted to give that as the shout out. But I also consider that a little bit of the failing because ultimately, really, Ross and I are the only two who were really truly familiar with the comic. Yeah, um, and. I kept putting kind of more in jokes with right. with that, and that's that's the diff- danger of doing licensed settings in yeah. general. I think, um, and you know, like Caleb, I mean, we've talked about this not I think on the podcast, but in real life, I remember Caleb was like, "I don't want to play." I know, like I had an idea for a Fallout game, like I, or I had an idea for a game, and then I finally figured out it could work in Fallout because it's a very particular type of game. And Caleb's like, I don't want to do that because I'm like, why would you be in somebody else's sam? There's always going to be someone more important than you. Eh. So he doesn't even want to play like Fallout, which is like there are no like major can't. There's no like equivalent to Superman or Atomic Robo in that. No. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of like one of those things. Why do you want to play in a game where there's going to be someone cooler than you? Uh, you came up with a great solution to that, but like that also comes up like in Star Wars. Like mm-hmm. most gamers, they're like, they're, it's in Star Wars, but like, no, we're way away from Luke and. You know Chewbacca and all that stuff. We're <laughs> we're just like we're we're, we're never going to encounter Vader. Yeah, uh, or Darth or if Maul. You do encounter Vader? You're, you're done f up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or it's in the extended unit. It's in Legacy or Legend. Was it Legacy or Legends now? Legends, right. Legends. Legends. Yeah, like oh, Legends is in the old EU. Yeah, like, yeah, hey, Legacy was actually a pretty decent. <laughs> I'm sorry, all right. That, that, that's that's Legend. why I was asking. But, I, but I'm saying, yeah, that's. Uh, but the biggest one, like using, like having Atomic Robo overshine, is that never happened. No, no. So you, were, you did, you did very good. There. Um, and I've I've seen other ways that other players have done that. Uh, specifically, when I picked up the game at Gen Con, I was talking to somebody who did a test play uh, with the creators, yeah. and they said the reason, the way that they mitigated that was uh, they did uh, Atomic. Everybody was Atomic Robo from different eras that's how they that was their see solution. that would be good for a, that's that's great for a con game obviously not for a campaign no that would, <laughs> that would get that would get old repetitive. very quickly yeah. uh or yeah. i do know that david had a moment where i don't know if that was just the campaign was the the canning characters were outshining us or if it was just kind of a slip on aaron's part and i don't want to speak for david or say his feelings but yeah. i do he i he's quotable on mentioning that there was one moment where some where one of the NPCs said, "We need a real physicist," ah. and that's where that was David's strong suit. Yeah, and he just was like, at that, he did not appreciate that much at all. Uh, all right, yeah, so. that's uh, and I don't remember that particular. Moment, I think I do. Um, it was when that. trying to align up the teleportation device. Was that in the last session or next last? No, session? that was that was uh, in uh, Big Trouble in Akihabara, uh, okay. and. 
I did not mean that as a part of his skills. It was basically just I had an NPC, uh, uh, NPC scientist in there who was being a jackass, and I was setting up this as a social test to basically okay. put him in his place. And uh, and yeah, the, so yeah, that that's more of like a table etiquette thing. Like that's the NPC presenting a challenge, not like your character concept is useless. But that's easy to misinterpret. That's very right. mm-hmm. uh, and that's certainly kind of like. An ongoing struggle. Uh, I also know yeah. David. Also, he also said that at sometimes the difficulties needed were a little insane. Uh, yeah, we, we we talked about yeah. that. I know that's. I mean, that's. And I think again, that was because we were always rolling for our primary skills, mm-hmm. and yeah. so in order to present any kind of challenge, the the, the target numbers had to rise. So yeah, I mean, you could tell. There's one moment. I think it was in when we were on the ship. Yeah, that David's like, I'm not. Okay, I'm not even gonna bother to roll because I can't make it. Right, uh, David. Yeah, so. Uh, that 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 I think we kind of addressed that. We but, did. No, we yeah. did. It, but, but I'm just saying what what he told me. I mean, it's an ongoing thing in any kind of superhero oh, yeah. game. I think uh, the problem that you need to do, or the thing is, again, challenge their weak weaknesses instead, uh, or mix it up. So a specialists uh, in base raiders, I I have to like, well, you, everyone gets attacked or everyone takes damage. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's I easy. I mean, like, yeah, I think like put a science guy. That's easy to do too. He's tiny. Right. Uh, he's not a combat character. No, not um, at all. So yeah, um, it just it just kind of depends. Um, I mean, so you learned a lot about running a campaign. I absolutely did. Yeah. So kind of what we would need for another structure, and I actually look forward to trying to do this again. Um, not uh, not possibly with Robo, although I do like playing in it. Um, you but- know, one thing I do want to mention about Atomic Robo. Uh, one of the reasons why I was really eager to play was that I wanted to investigate using these rules. Since Michael also wrote them, <coughs> and he also wrote Strange Freight, which is what Base Raiders is. is I, Base Raiders is uses. So I was thinking about, hey, second edition of Base Raiders could use this version of Fate. But now that I think about it, I think I'll stick with Strange Fate, but I'll modify it more to suit my own ends uh, because it doesn't quite fit the Base Raider aesthetic. <laughs> uh, but The Vaporwave aesthetic. The Vaporwave, because you can do superpowers in this, but it's very oriented towards Atomic Robo, science heroes doing this kind of thing. Yeah, and, and it's it does- not like a general purpose superpower creation thing. Uh, no, no, it's very much aligned only to yeah, the science aesthetic and it doesn't lend well to over like mysticism because the closest thing that really comes to it is maybe up uh, uh, like un- undead Edison, however, right. but it's he's obviously a creation of parallel. Well, dimension. I mean that's just a matter of reskinning like yeah. uh, right. of the fate mechanics, but yeah, I mean fate gaming is different uh, and I think we all learned well, something about fate. Even fate gaming is that there's different ways to manage it. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Um, such as like Dresden yeah. uses, you know, you buy skills, stunts, mega stunts with your yeah. fate points, and the number of fate points you have directly gives you a feeling as to your overall power level. Yeah. And NPCs are statted with a fate point pool, so you get a feeling as to what is their power level. With the exception of a few that are just like we're not assigning a fate point total because. This is, they are plot device level characters. They're not meant to be overcome. You either disengage or work around. Right. Um, but in Robo, there's no such scaling system. Uh, they do have some type of scaling mechanics. They, they work quite differently. And that's in terms of like the number of uh, skill points you get and what kind of mega stunts you can get. Like mega stunts have a budget system. So you can mega stunts are basically yeah. the equivalent of strange skills. But or, there isn't a number affixed to the bottom of a character that gives you that idea uh, when you're encountering. No, it, it does work differently. Yes, yeah. uh, but it can. It, it, there are. Um, that is an issue. Like yeah. power levels of characters, it's like balancing. Like how, like especially if you're doing this on the fly, how do you balance like one bad guy versus four good guys or yeah. characters? Um, but yeah, we definitely need to play more fake gaming. You run more campaigns. Uh, we need more campaigns in general. Uh, yep. I got because yeah, we're running dry, Ross. <laughs> yeah, the, the backlog. The, and running also, the wells and almost and tapped. And oh also, my god! And also, I, I'll soon be uh, doing a fake campaign myself. Uh, um, Star Wars. Star Wars is not fake. That's fun. He's running it in fate. I'm running it in fate. Oh, okay. Oh, we're not using the. No, because I, I realized I don't actually want to have to have a completely different set of dice to run this game. <laughs> okay. And also, I think that's probably the best way that if you want to dabble with anyone being a force user, that fate mm-hmm. would give you the kind of. Are you using use. fate core or fate accelerated? Or have you figured that out? Yet? It's uh, There's actually a published uh, Star Wars fate. Okay. Well, a fan thing. 
Well, the conver- a conversion guide. So it's a, yeah, it's conversion. I don't guide. think it's official. I don't think Evil Hat has that. License. No, it's not official. Yeah. But yeah. it's okay. it's what everyone uses that runs Star Wars and Fate. I think it's what. Uh, it's what all the cool kids. Are no, it's it's what uh, you. This what you use, wasn't it? No, I use, you use one roll engine. Yeah, yeah, I That's used, it, yeah, and I just use wild talent, this, which is different from Fate. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we should know. <laughs> We've been running it for God knows how long. <laughs> just want to make sure. You know. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll be doing that soon. Okay. Uh, okay. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so this is, and it's a good thing I, I, I look at a tongue robot. That's also good training. It is it, it, like again, fate, yeah, definitely for fate because I get a lot of it is also using aspects and understanding how fate points can be spent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, the thing is, the fate points are really more than just the plus two to your roll, uh, yeah. which is their greatest strength, and uh, that's sort of underutilized, I think, in most fate games. Uh, but uh, they've kind of, yeah. So, uh, any final thoughts on Atomic Robo? Um, Ultimately, I'm glad. Science I, I'm, pros. I'm, yeah. I'm assuming everybody really enjoyed it. Yeah. So, for the most, uh, uh, despite its flaws. So, yeah, yeah. Um, like I said, I think uh, there's some comparisons to Sense of the Slide of Hand Man, Journey, uh, the continuity thing, which again, because of that. Uh, and again, Tribes of Tokyo, the, the mechanics thing, because we didn't master the system first, which we really should do before we run camp. <laughs> yeah, we should. We should. We, should. we, should. we don't. We should. Uh, it, it, we yeah. can't make an exception in red markets because the game doesn't exist fully. But at yet. the same time, though, it's one of those things that, you know, how else are you going to master the system? Yeah. Like, are we going to spend countless hours mastering a system before we. Well, I mean, record? by that, I mean by doing one shots and also, like, looking at all the rules. Because, the yeah, like, I said, yeah. that's what we did with uh, yeah. Clips Phase. Like, we first yeah. we did a one shot. Yeah. Then we did the campaign. Uh, we did several one shots first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I ran a one shot, then Caleb ran a one shot. Uh, and then we got into no. I ran a one shot later. Yeah, uh, they 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 are out there. So, uh, but yeah, that's uh, I think a pretty very productive episode. I, I had a lot of fun with it. It was a fun campaign. It was definitely a nice little bit of sunshine in an otherwise. <laughs> Thank you. World of dark. <laughs> yeah. Post apocalyptic freelance zombie killing and then trigger like, warnings yeah, yeah. And, uh, just uh, something a little little sunshine before we got into God's teeth you know oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, uh, it's, it, and God's teeth is so much fun but yeah it's it's sometimes uh, need... well, I mean it's not nearly as dark as either one so uh, it, but it's not like super cheerful I don't know it's it's been the, it's, but, it's or like, no, okay, okay, that's the also world. the point in the settings yeah. history that you guys are at that's yeah. just like things are pretty crap right now yeah so. But not everyone on Earth is doomed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, we'll see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. And the grim uh, dark rolls on. <laughs> so. uh, but I think you can see all the lessons we've learned from Atomic Robo, uh, like showing up in like Dan's last session of uh, that. I think we can see some of the lessons coming mm-hmm. forward uh, and giving. Are players. you talking like? The, uh, the 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 not, not the, the season finale, but the last one you yes, guys played. the last one okay. we played. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no spoilers. It was amazing. Uh, so trust it when you get there. I think I came up with that on the fly. I know. It was <laughs> and so did we. Uh, it, was, it, was, uh, yeah. it was our idea, yeah. and then you ran with it. Yeah. Uh, collaboration, collaboration. Bitches. That's what it's about. Uh, <laughs> and so when we get back, and listened. Uh, we will have shout outs and anecdotes. Yep. So we're right. back. Actually, go anywhere? Just you know, behind the scenes. Well, Ross thing. went somewhere. Yeah, I went to a musical wonderland, an abandoned mall that played all his bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Ross uh, pee peed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no. Yeah, we take a break in recording. Jesus. Uh, thanks for. You're welcome. You just uh, broke the illusion for so many. Or did I stuff. confirm it? Yeah, hit pause, <laughs> stop on recording. Uh, so anyway, we have some shout outs. Uh, first off, I'd like to mention Showa Volume 3. Uh, this is uh, Shigeru uh, Mizuki's uh, History of Japan. Uh, this is from 1944 to 1953, uh, the end of World War II. He's uh, a soldier uh, in the South Pacific. Things are not going well for him, uh, but he survives, obviously, and then he has to deal with the immediate uh, post-war reconstruction of Japan, the occupation by the um, you know American military, and uh, it's you know one of these 500-page book manga v- histories of Japan. It's very interesting. Uh, it mixes his personal life with the history of the country as a whole. Uh, mentions some about world history, and it's just a well-written, uh, insightful into it. Co- covers all aspects: politics, cult- culture. 
uh, and art, obviously. Uh, changing of uh, popular culture, like he starts out after the world drawing, um, I forgot what the name of it, but it's a form of popular entertainment before television was popular where this guy would get these drawings and then he would recite a story based on these drawings. So it's kind of like audio book, live audio book manga uh, is the only equivalent. And he would, kids would love to sit down and watch these, listen to them and buy candy and that's how they made mm-hmm. money. So he drew for the performers new stories every week uh, oh. that they would nice. recite. Uh, but that went out of fashion, and so uh, then he got into manga at the very end. Um, and yeah, uh, no, yeah, I was saying uh, Ross has gotten me into the series as well as Faust. Um, he's lent me the first one, which I'm halfway through, and it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I, um, I, uh, yeah, especially he since he uh, since he's also uh, he in. As a narrator, he injects one of his more popular manga, his manga yokai characters yeah. in there as well. Uh, that's the main character, which uh, narrator, yeah. Uh, which just kind of a little preview from that. I love that when he's giving the uh, narrators giving history, sometimes the characters will, the actual historical characters will interact with them, saying, yeah. "What are you doing?" And they'll just slap him down, saying, "I'm telling this story. Shut up." Uh, yeah, it's a very entertaining <laughs> history. Um, let's see here. Uh, I also want to mention a uh, after the fall a. An Eclipse Phase anthology of fiction has been released. Uh, a lot of new authors. They've also included all the stuff from the RPG books, if you haven't read those already. Uh, but they've also a bunch of new stories, including one about space whales, uh, which I'm going to have to read. Uh, so I got my copy. Is it a story of how to integrate them into an actual game? Well, I haven't read it yet, Tom. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm just saying, sorry. If you like like Eclipse, yeah, if you just like Eclipse Phase, you should totally read this. because I mean, No, I am, I know, I'm just waiting for the campaign where this is... Well, maybe I'll get a campaign idea from this, or at least maybe you will. (laughs) And I'll just ambush Caleb with it. All right, here's your pregen. What is this? Space whale. Uh, Uh, Oh yeah. First, we'll get his car keys, and so we can. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, Uh, invite him over to have some. Like, yeah, we'll have some drinks, and then we'll. Role play. Uh, I, I don't know if I don't know a drunk Caleb, and then you throw space whales. That's volatile. That's yeah. no. It's like, so then, and then, then it's like drunk, washing so clothes with diamonds. Justify taking gasoline. And then, and then he, yeah. And then he finds out all the all the pregens are Syria. All right, yeah. space whale. Dan. Yeah. Sun if we do this, this is going to be the reverse, but it's going to be in, instead of you and rubber, it's going to be Caleb and space whales. <laughs> uh, you know what? I owe him for that. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit! <I'm okay>. Revenge, <laughs> the best vengeance. No, uh, you don't owe him. That was me. No, no, he was there. Caleb was part of it. He was. I know. Caleb was the one laughing. We'll have something for you. Like Caleb, and, Caleb <laughs> derived <laughs> enough pleasure out of it that I feel like payback is earned. I, uh, <laughs> no, no, yeah, 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 you and I, you and I felt uncomfortable. All right. Uh, so, uh, Tom, I know there's a game you... Yeah, I've mentioned. been playing a game on Steam, Undertale. Which Slightly is, popular with the kids these days. F- yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, and I can see why. It's it's a very, like, the, it's done by one guy. Yeah. And it's kind of a, kind of a JRPG. Uh, it's very much inspired by Earthbound. Mm-hmm. For this, but it's yeah. one of those that it, you know, like, I started playing, like, all right, like, this gets got good reviews, so I'll give it a try, and, like... Hey, it's uh, three o'clock in the morning, and I'm not even tired. Yeah, it is. Just, it's absolutely sucks you in, and it's one of those that the character is like, "I can't kill anyone. I will not." So, no. Yeah. So the one thing about Undertale that I know, uh, JRPG, but you can choose not to kill any Anything. character you defeat in a battle. You kill. And they're gone from the game, and the the mm-hmm. story reflects these changes. Yeah. So it's or, not like or, or it's the can, opposite or, of the Final Fantasy, where like you defeat a villain and then he runs away, and like ha 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 ha, we'll fight again. You haven't even seen my final no, form. Dead is dead is dead is dead, dead is dead. Uh, and you can shoot. <laughs> there are pacifist ways to get around fights. Actually, it's every fight. Every fight. Every yeah. single fight is uh, you can essentially find a way to peacefully stop it. Yeah. And you can go through the entire game that way. That way, and it's the only way I can play. I can't. Like I, I I cannot fight anything. So yeah, there are two ways to play it: uh, pacifist runs and or genocide. Genocide runs. I kind of want to be the like pacifist, except for if I, there's a character I really hate, it's like, nah, you're gonna die. The, uh, the thing is, there I haven't played it. yet. I own it. I have not. Yeah. Played the thing it. is, yeah, yeah. I, there isn't every single character. Is That's like just so your well opinion, written. man. Uh, no, it's not just my opinion, Ross. Okay, it's objective. But no, seriously, it is a especially for the for the price it is right now. Definitely, definitely pick it up. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Aaron, uh, other games. Uh, you got a great one for Christmas. Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, my Santa gift for my parents this year uh, was the Cryptozoic Ghostbusters board game. Um, this was kickstarted last year? No, or, or the year before. So, um, It's okay. 
Uh, but no, it is a wonderful one. It's an actually a choose your own, basically a randomly generated mission and map. So you have tiles with specific. So a little levels. like betrayal on House on the Hill. A little bit like that, except yeah. that you will you have a set of cards that you'll pull over. It tells you where you're going, how many ghosts are on the field, and what positions you're set. And uh, the the story behind this one is that a demon uh, that they had released. I guess he was like an under minion of Gozer. Yeah. So or like the third. Uh, traveler goes doing bad things. Yeah, goes doing bad things. Uh, has managed to escape from hell and is setting up everybody, uh, setting up more ghosts for the Ghostbusters to take care of. Of course, as like uh, as like you do. Um, but it's really cool because it is four player. Um, there's an experience tracker on it, so you can actually play this in a campaign mode oh, where oh, cool. you gain extra abilities on each <laughs> Ghostbuster as you go up. Interesting. Um, it has very well produced. Um, uh, miniatures for all the ghosts, including since I got the Kickstarter backed one, I have a glow in the dark uh, Slimer, which has no other purpose but than just being a glow in the dark Slimer. But you can go up in levels from the min the regular ghost minions, uh, that main one of Gozer, and also you will of course have the Safe Puff Marshmallow Man. Of course, so he is he not? is the pinnacle of what you. No have one to else can think of anything else now. You know? <laughs> Why would you? Yeah. Well, that's no, because of the first guy, because Ray thought of it, and now everyone's like, oh, God, it's that thing that – there's like a billion photos of it online. Well, let, let's be, let's be like, honest. Do you know what a slore looks like? Uh, no. I played the game. Well, you Shut know up. what I would think? <laughs> Anything else. <laughs> A stapler. It's a giant stapler attacking Manhattan. But no, it's, it's uh, good. Will we have a giant red line taking us out? Nice. Uh, <laughs> I'd go for that. Uh, Dan, you mentioned a game that you haven't played yet, but you're interested in hearing about. Well, right? it actually harmonizes Tom's shout-out for a Steam game and Aaron's shout-out for a board game. Yeah. Oh. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> ha <Ha-ha>. Hey, <laughs> I found the balance. <laughs> um, you were the chosen one. <laughs> uh, you were the one. It's called Armello, and it seems really interesting. I've watched the trailer. A few friends of mine picked it up when it was on the winter Steam sale. Yeah. Uh, I didn't pick it up due to equal parts laziness and not really wanting to pull the trigger on $5 because money was a little tighter on the holidays. But now, it, miraculously, I'm now more okay with pulling the trigger on $20. Um uh, so yeah, it's like a fantasy board game. It's a fantasy board game that's got story and RPG elements, and it's very multiplayer friendly. And that's it's like a Conquer Kingdom kind of game, right? Kind of, yeah. Kind of like this game or Final Fantasy Tactics, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it looks like some of the animation and some of the cutscene work looks pretty well done. And it looks like it's totally going to be worth the money when I decide to do it. I just need to decide when I'm going to do it uh, and yeah. start playing with the people that I know and anybody that wants to play with uh, me. Yeah, if, in the comments. Uh, Dan, We have an RPPR Steam group. You can find Dan on that. He's Fuzzy Dan, I think, on Steam. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, of course, there's the RPPR message board. You can probably set up a thread for that once you get that. Pull the trick yeah. on that. Uh, so... Uh, that sounds cool. Um, I've actually got another Steam game for the Christmas sale. Uh, Something to see. Uh, it's yeah, it's a good the, one. Yeah, uh, it's put up by the people who did Fall in London, uh, and you're basically in an underground Victorian realm, uh, and there's a lot of text, and you have a boat, and you have to go out, and you have to go make money. And it's kind of like a roguelike. Hmm. They randomly generate the map to a certain degree, and there's tons of missions, and so you can be a, you can go to ports and get report, uh, go to different port cities. And gather intelligence for the London uh, admiralty. Yeah, you can go pirate, if or you, you can want go to. be a pirate, or you can be a trader, or you can investigate mysteries. No, or wait, a trader, or traitor. <laughs> well, Both. a little bit. Traitor. Little, little a, little b. Uh, you can also <laughs> um, fight giant monsters in your little boat. Uh, mm. You can up. recruit some monsters. You can recruit, recruit monsters. I like. I happen to. I love the rubbery men. <laughs> Okay, I haven't gotten to them yet. I haven't found them yet. Uh, I am aware of their existence, though. Uh, so, and there's it, it's a lot of there's a lot of text, so there's a lot of good writing. So, uh, very lo- a lot of good writing. Yeah, yeah. and uh, like I found an island where there were rats and uh, sentient rats and guinea pigs that were at war for control over the island. And <laughs> were I, they once a man? men? Uh, no, they were, they were they were always guinea pigs and rats. <laughs> uh, and, and, don't, they, and they'll thank I you not to try not to ask them that question. Uh, and you get to choose who wins their little civil war and uh, then help their society build up and that kind of thing. So that's just one of many quests. Uh, and uh, so that's a fun little game. Um, 
Let's see. In other Steam games, one I think we've all played uh, sooner or later, Duck Game. Yeah. Uh, which I can't believe we have to. Uh, there's a button to quack. Uh, it is a side scrolling deathmatch game uh, and with tons of different levels. I have yet to meet anyone in our group, remotely involved in our group, who has not played or watched this game being played and not loved it. Yeah, we need. To, we yeah. will record this for Raillery at some point. I've just been lazy. Uh, <laughs> now that I've enabled mods for it, like there's tons of mods for it in the Steam Workshop. <laughs> Uh, and there's also gameplay mods. How do you expand mods? on perfection, Ross? <laughs> more levels, more masks. Oh, okay. There's there's payday masks. As, as long as you mod. can keep oh, quacking. Oh, yeah. You can be jacket. Uh, you can be wearing... That's it. your dream, not ours. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> hey, as long as you can keep quacking. Yeah, you can keep quacking. Uh, but there's like low gravity uh, or everything <laughs> explodes when you shoot it. Uh, or everything has infinite ammo. Uh, so um, there's lots of little gameplay mods. And um, oh, I'm sorry. We have- so you just jump. It's side-scrolling platforming, but you pick up guns and then you shoot your enemy. And everyone is dead in one hit, usually. Yeah, and uh, yeah, unless you have armor or something. But uh, Ross and you and I had talked about this. The game, is for something that is looks simple and is actually produced by Adult Swim. Yeah, uh, games, published by them. Uh, published by them. Uh, it is amazingly streamlined. It so. is very fast. It is very balanced. And the levels are very well. There's a bunch of user-made levels, too, uh, which I've thro- I'll throw into the queue. And we'll see how well those work out. Uh, and so, yeah, that's something to look forward to. Uh, it should be fun in the sun. Uh, let's hear Tom. You have the worst shout out do. have ever I, I do. had I, on this fucking show. I can't believe you're doing this, but I can't stop you, apparently. Uh, so tell us. Now I don't even know if I want to do it. Great. All right, moving on. Crystal Pepsi. Damn it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's coming back out, and it's, gonna, it's coming out in July, which means I could be in Gen Con this year. With a Crystal Pepsi. You know what? I might join you for a Crystal Pepsi. Would you? Oh, God. All right. Spread. Thanks, well, it's going to be the Crystal Pepsi and... Uh, uh, Surge? White Surge. Oh, it's like... Surge? White, okay. White, what? White Whoa. Whoa. You're putting Surge in the same sentence as Crystal Pepsi? <laughs> no, I, I was saying... How I was, dare you? No, I'm saying it's going to be Crystal Pepsi and White Castle we're going to have to be dealing with. No. We've not. dealt with White Castle, although that's like... It's together now. That's David's Yeah, thing. we don't have to have them at the same time. No, we don't. Well, don't <laughs> yeah, are, because White Castle doesn't serve Pepsi, do they? I hope not. No, they no, they serve a... The one thing they do serve that no one else does is that red cream soda. Okay. That, and they're from the fountain. That stuff's okay. pretty great, though. Yeah, it's the A&W red cream soda. Yeah. Okay. But, but no, it's it's coming. They're really, because of the success of Surge, Pepsi's bringing it back but out. But people like Surge. People like Crystal people Pepsi. People liked Crystal Pepsi, Ross. They just didn't people market it correctly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so judgmental about soda. Uh, yeah, oh, we've got another Steam multiplayer game, Crawl. Uh, oh, yeah. Crawl is a weird kind of hybrid. Uh, like, yeah, I was just watching it and I was having pro- trouble. Uh, it's like three player, one player is a human adventurer who's trying to get to level 10 to kill the boss so he can escape the dungeon. The other three players are ghosts that are possess monsters or traps to kill that player. And if they do that, whoever does that gets to possess the body and become the adventurer. And then, so you, you're taking two turns being human trying to get to level 10 then you have to fight the boss yeah it's, All, yeah it's weird and it's like it feels a lot kind of like munchkin where it's like everyone's working together ish screw you yeah yeah but then we're just actually <coughs> trying to set up the big fuck you to get to level 10 and get out yeah it's a good so. comparison to munchkin uh it's got really cool retro graphics and style to it it's just it's way too complex to be a simple art. It's not Duck Game. Duck Game, you just... It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't a good game yeah. to, to have while we were getting drunk on New Year's. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> exactly. I knew it, uh, and I was sober, and I was having a hard time seeing what was going uh, on. We got a couple more. Uh, let's see here. We have uh, a great movie we watched, uh, Five Element Ninjas. A Jesus classic Christ. of the Shaw oh Brothers God. studio uh, from 1982. It's what happens when a Hong Kong, you know, Kung Fu studio, uh, movie studio decides, what are ninjas and samurai like? Apparently like this. We'll uh, make it up as we go. Uh, with ninjas, ha- there's like one for each of the five classical Chinese elements, uh, like wood, metal, uh, fire, 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 and fire and water. And water. Did they do that movie with anthropomorphic kangaroo people? No, that doesn't that exist. Was, uh, that, was, that was Warriors of Virtue. Okay. Uh, I mean, Warriors and, of Virtue didn't have crotch stabbing. Uh, they did not. Uh, they did not. The Earth crotch. Ninjas could g- burrow like uh, graboids from Tremors, but they had spears and they would stab the thighs and crotch of the heroes. Uh, also, this movie was great because there were like. 30 protagonists, uh, heroes oh, that were all murdered. Well, it, except d- for one. Yeah, just to give you a little like, idea of this, the, the entire, the first part of this movie starts off with two rival clans? Uh, uh, the Martial Arts Alliance, Alliance and the Outlaw Bandits. Jesus. I, 
Yeah. Oh, I didn't Intricate know. story. No, the anyway, Japanese. But of course. Yeah. yeah well, they, the outlaw bandits have a samurai. Yeah, but the, mm. the, yeah, the martial arts alliance and the outlaw bandits are fighting each other in a tournament for control, but nobody dies. Uh, uh, what are uh, you talking about? Well, nobody dies in the initial conflict okay. until the, one of them brings in a samurai, yeah. uh, a, a samurai uh, pitch hitter, so to speak. <laughs> Designated hitter. Um, yeah, designated samurai. <laughs> designated <hitter>. samurai. <laughs> My uh, samurai. Japanese punk uh, rockabilly band. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, do we have to keep talking about this? I okay. think. I All think right, it's great. Enough. Watch it. It's on YouTube. Yeah. We we did the fight scenes yes, are amazing. It's so great. It's on YouTube. You it's, know a what else? it's a Shaw Brothers <laughs> movie. All right. They're you know what else is so great the... that it's all on YouTube? Team America: World Police, Ross. Uh, <laughs> Okay, huh? so they're both great movies. I don't know, like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm just, just all right. Just pointing um, things out. So finally, uh, or two more. Actually, I do want to mention Spirit of Seventy Seven, a uh, oh, yes. exploitation film themed uh, apocalypse world RPG. I got a review copy uh, from people who put it out. Uh, I think they're Monkey Fun Games, and it got amazing cover art, and it's apocalypse world similar to Monster of the Week, Dungeon World, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm looking forward to playing or running, probably running it first, and then playing. It's a great pickup yeah. game. And, you know, uh, so that's going to be fun. Uh, look forward to that at some point. Uh, and then finally, Everything is Terrible Legends, a 12-hour uh, three-disc DVD set. Uh, it's, a only three, th- no, it's a 12-hour three-disc extravaganza. Uh, bo- yeah, a Endurance wa- test. Uh, $15 on their website. <laughs> uh, this is all the stuff they've put on the web, including stuff that they put on the web, and then it got removed for <laughs> various <laughs> reasons. <laughs> Uh, copyright infringement. Uh, it is amazing. Obscene. Totally not safe for work. Uh, it. They don't give a shit about what you think. They, they just put it in. Oh it's my called God. everything is terrible. Yeah. Everything is terrible. So uh, check that out. Uh, but <laughs> if you if you can if, if your you, eyes if, don't if, believe if you are strong enough. Uh, so finally, uh, we can now get into ready. anecdotes. Um, I think we should talk about Red Markets because the Red Markets campaign beta beta is coming out. Uh, but we Caleb <coughs> is still working on it, and so we, he's been doing one shots recently. We're, we're going to do another playtest campaign that I will be running. And Caleb will be playing it, Woo. and Caleb uh, will love it. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, but. Uh, Dan, you were in that. We, we we all did a one shot. Uh, <laughs> that was my second time ever playing Red Markets. The first time I was playing in early, early, early alpha rules when there yeah. were still character classes. Uh, yes, yep. uh, they've been replaced by tough spots. Um, so we all made characters. Um, I made a guy who was really adaptable. Uh, I don't remember much else. Uh, we were our group was called the Wrecking Crew, I think. Yes. Uh, and uh, Bill was in that one, and yep. he was a black math cultist, black mm-hmm. math. Uh, and I was, I was also kind of a black. Oh, that was Fido and Leash. Fido and Leash, yeah. yeah. Fido and Leash. Oh my God! Tell us about Fido and Leash. <laughs> uh, Fido was well, actually his name was Spot. Spot. I'm sorry. Well, it made sense. Like latent, if he's he was a latent, and he and his cohort Leash, who was a black mask, have decided that you know what. I, you know, let's let's use the enhanced strength and immunity to the disease as a latent to just murder eight as many zombies as possible. And it's Leash's job to leash me in when I finally lose control and become one myself. Yep. And so we were just running it strictly by the numbers. We need to make sure that I would kill so many zombies that it doesn't matter how many people I killed when I finally turned. We, humanity would still be in the black. <laughs> wow, yeah, that's, that's black math in a nutshell. <laughs> Kill as many as possible uh, by any means necessary. Uh, and oh no, my character was a um, basically a spy, an undercover mm-hmm. taker working for the government. Uh, let's see here, Tom. I was a uh, slightly crazy person. <laughs> yeah, uh, and Aaron, you. Uh, I was an immune negotiator oh, yeah, uh, right. that named Coyote, so I, I pretty much had the whole social skills package. Um, and our job was to deliver and a. Sean was in it too. Oh, Sean, yeah, Sean was in it. Yes. Sean was Sunny. The Sean. Was, Sean mm-hmm. plays prominently. So Sunny the sniper. The. And, son, and his name is, was also his disposition. About <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, so the job we finally took was. Uh, this is in the southwest near Hoover Dam. We had to take a, an ar- a shipment of arms to a location. Uh, the the shipment was in a locked uh, metal container that was also rigged to explode if we tampered with it. Uh, so we couldn't seal it. So we had to well, do that. Was, and the, we just had to deliver the weapons while other people were being distracted. There were other interesting Yes, because it was, it, yeah, it was actually located because we were driving a modified ambulance called the uh, Wambulance. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, so... 
the first encounter, uh, Kill Bros, <laughs> something really bad, which is a stampede, basic massive horde of zombies. And unfortunately, there are civilians being chased by them. And, and we were all like, uh, maybe we should just keep going. Uh, well, I was driving because I was literally the only character who took driving <laughs> as a skill. But no, we were discussing it as a group. Yeah. Like, maybe we should just keep, we should just keep yeah, going. Yeah, we hadn't f- fully decided what we we're going to do yet. And then uh, I made a decision. You made a decision. <laughs> you, Aaron, made a decision. <laughs> what was your decision, Aaron? I'm going to rescue the woman. All right. That's the only right thing to do. And yeah. her child. Yep. And her child. And uh, But also, I'll say, you could have made a decision too. You could have just driven on. Oh, but I didn't because I didn't give a shit. I was just like, fuck it. We'll do it. I could. I trust We're doing it live. I trust in my so driving I, two ability. So this is on us, my friend. Oh, no, no, no. I don't us, care. It, bullshit. Yeah, no. Bullshit. You, <laughs> no, no. Ross just responded to your decision. He could have responded another way. I'm not going to take you. I'm not going to remove it. I thought, yeah. No, no. <laughs> Ross was not intending to get us all killed, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ross did not intend to risk everyone's life without yeah. consulting the I was group. just trying to protect our group as a whole. So, anyway. The greater good. You're so full of shit. Don't put this on me. Don't put this on me <laughs> I at all. I will. All you right. know no, this is all you. You can, but shit. Anyway. No, like, no. I'm pretty certain that the fans are going to listen to this at yeah. some point, and it'll be a unanimous decision with only you as the descending <laughs> vote as to whether or not this was your no, fault. No, because I bring up the uh, anyway. object of hi- Hex Hollow, but otherwise, let's continue. Yeah, this, this is totally a Hex Hollow. Uh, you just run off into the sunset. The sunset which being zombies. Which means that, like, after like a round or two... But then you drove in after me. I drove in after you. It's like, we have to save our, our negotiator. Uh, so... We get the woman. The woman's like, save my baby, save my husband. And the husband's further out. And so we drive in further, and things get bad. We get swamped by zombies. Because it is a stampede. It's like- a stampede. So many zombies. Uh, and the problem is, Sean, this is Sean's first game playing right It is. And we're testing out new rules. One of which is, which we don't do at all in the playtest campaign, is that random damage rules. Yes. Random damage rolls, sorry. So, like... In the original play, beta, t- whatever you roll to attack was also how much damage you get. Uh, in this one, it's a separate roll to like uh, so, and he just he gets like all the damage on his shooting arm. So it was like ten lethal damage. Ten lethal damage on his fucking arm, uh, and he's not immune or latent either. So that's a hidden infection roll. None of us have a blood test kit because we don't. No, <laughs> we, those are expensive, uh, and. So he's a sniper, and in the first roll of the game, he can't use his fucking sniper rifle anymore. <laughs> and, oh, God. Uh, and Dan got nearly got his leg torn off. Uh-huh. But you're, you're latent, so you're not infected it, right. anymore. But, no, you're just, you're but just, I was leaking. You were just, <laughs> yeah, you were, and, and you're just ha- gushing infected and blood. One, yeah, yeah, and once we got the husband into the ambulance, yeah. uh, Dan fell on Dan it. Dan decided to act, do his fountain impression all over me. I didn't decide nothing because of somebody's horrible choice to drive us into a stampede of zombies. I had my drive. I just on. Dude, he's trying to pop while this off on you, Ross. While hanging on to the top of the ambulance, and the only way to save myself at all was to get in the ambulance. I was not aware that there was a man laying unconscious that was being exposed to my infected blood. I had other things on my mind, Aaron. Lots and lots of yeah. other things. Now, while we will never know... Well, yeah, my character kind of had tunnel vision. I was like, don't fail a drive check. Save my two will for driving checks. And then that was all. Do I need to make it? I'd make a driving check to do the thing. Okay. I make it. Yay. Oh, what, how are you guys doing? I don't yeah, know. I, I, <laughs> card, do the thing. And, yeah. and unlike, unlike Sean, who you'll never know was infected or not... Oh, yeah, because, yeah, so, okay, we get clear of the stampede with the woman, her kid, and her husband. Her husband husband is, like, passed out, passed out, bitten, or... Well, not bitten, but exhausted. Exhausted, but he's been leaked on by the lady. (laughs) Yeah. Actually, I think he'd already been bitten. It could have been, it could have been either way. Yeah. He was, I think he, I'm pretty sure he's He was probably on his way. He was already infected. It looked like, in fact, Caleb kind of made it clear to us that he was like, "Mm, that guy's not going to make it. He is probably, certainly infected. Uh, and so we're dealing with first aiding the two people, uh, like to keep Sean, you from bleeding out. To keep you from, where none of us have first aid. We barely have, we had the scavenger first aid kit <laughs> uh, from the way. Fortunately, there's one in the way ambulance, and so we're burning charges to keep you guys alive uh, and try and sal- We couldn't salvage uh, Sean's arm. Uh, we saw we, we, we had to use a reference it. to just like 
get your leg working so you could do shit anymore. I don't even know if that was what it was. It was yeah. just pretty much like, okay, you're just going to be hopped up on adrenaline shots and That was drugs. the reference. That was the reference. You're going to be hopped up on adrenaline shots and drugs, and hopefully your leg doesn't notice. Yeah, <laughs> uh, essentially. And then the – so what happened – a lot of stuff happens really quickly in a short time. One, right. the husband turns. Hubby, like hubby sits up suddenly Hus- full of energy. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Sean's character – I think is I don't remember exactly how he died. Uh, oh, he was, was oh one of the t- one of the uh, group shot him. Uh, okay, so uh, was that you? Did you shoot him? I'm pretty sure I did. Oh, oh no, was it, was, no, was it there? I'm trying to figure. No, no, Sean was so pissed off about the losing the dad eye. becoming. Oh yeah, he he was holding the gun on the woman. Like so, it's like, it's like you know, yeah, that's it's why it's nobody like, noticed it. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Like, it's like you put our team in danger. That's right. No, her husband came up. I shot him, and the, I one shot him. Yeah, you shot it. You killed the husband, but yeah, t- and Sean that's what and that's what washed over Sean. Uh yeah, and so Sean was heavily infected. So I don't remember exactly. Well, no, we we don't know if he was infected. Yeah. So I, did someone shoot him? Someone shot him. Okay. Uh, someone. Yeah. Someone made the call to shoot him because he was maybe the, Bill's character. I think he ran the risk of being. I think infected. it was. It might, I think it was Bill. Yeah, and that was uh, Sean's character was someone's dependent. Uh, Mine. Yes. So and I went full crazy. Yeah. After you, that. Uh, you took like five stress from that. Which no, I, I basically I lost all of my first level of detachment. Yeah, that's five stress. That's mm-hmm. like or six stress. Yeah, so like, you cracked. So. Yeah, you cracked. So that's like a temporary insanity. And in, uh, it, it, it affected how I played him the next game. Yeah, uh, yeah. You recycled your character for the next what shot. Uh, but so Sean is like in the first encounter in this first time playing Red Rocket dead, dead. and it's like, <laughs> well, he could play the maybe the woman's actually really competent. <laughs> That we rescued? Maybe he could be a replacement character. All right, fine. Well, what equipment do you have? Hey, you could use your dead character's equipment. <laughs> and uh, so that was our fir- his first encounter of that. So Caleb was like, well, the, the rules are working better now. Uh, death. So, yeah, death. Those random damage rolls. Really nice. Uh, so, Anything can happen. Yeah. Every, every, yeah. So. so, yes. And I think we will all establish it is, in fact, Aaron's fault. It is, in fact, Aaron's <laughs> fault. Uh, no. Yeah. You could have driven off. I enabled Aaron's fault. How about that? I, yeah, I, no, not even that. The, for all anyone no, could see, have known, No, see. No, no, Ross. No, think about it. Yeah. No, we needed him. He was our primary negotiator. Yeah. Okay. He was an asset to the team. Okay. Also, you... We could have just like you, we could have just driven up on Aaron and just grabbed him and thrown him in the back of the ambulance. Yeah, I could knocked do that, him yeah. the fuck out, yeah. and then we go to. The- yeah, I think the thing is we yeah we didn't. And Kale did make it clear if we drove away while the woman was crying for help, we would have taken humanity damage of yeah. some sort. Uh, but yeah, but then the woman is like not being cooperative, be like yeah, save my husband too. God, damn. I, it could have been worse. Like now, save my dog. Yeah, save my luggage. Yeah. <laughs> Save my Grand Victorian piano. <laughs> uh, save my elephant. Like, oh god my, damn it! How does that even happen? Like, the elephant can save itself. Like, <laughs> clearly, the elephant's on its own. If anything, the elephant should be a nice distraction. Yeah, it's it's just a giant piece of meat. Save my collection of World War II artillery. <laughs> well, you yeah no actually that would be that would yeah. make sense that we would definitely do that. Save my antique U boat. <laughs> We're in the desert. Yeah. Uh, so all the more reason why it's, it's valuable. Like, it's like save my M1 Abrams battle tank. <laughs> How? What? From like, what? Why are you running from these save, zombies? Save, yeah. save my ident back to Alamogoro. <laughs> now we're just being silly. We are. We are just being silly. <laughs> um, so I think that's a good shout out. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to talk about the Dresden Files campaign, but yes. there's. Uh, it's 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 coming up. We're, we're we have plans to release it in a timely uh. manner. Uh, yeah, we just soon need to you will know. It soon, yeah, because I'm tired of talking about it. In okay, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry. I'm a horrible monster. Uh, blame me. I'm truly the villain. Uh, Except, yeah, no, no. We already we... established we're blaming Aaron. <laughs> oh, awesome! No, <laughs> we're done with this. All right. So uh, this has been RBBR episode 124, the Atomic Robo campaign post mortem. I'm Ross Payton. I'm Tom. I'm Aaron Karsten. and I'm Dan. All right. Talk to you guys next time for science. Hey, everyone.